Hi, this is Barb Chamberlain. Welcome to this final session of today at the Washington Bike Walk Roll Summit. We'll be getting started in a minute or two as people get settled in. Grab yourself a, something to re refresh and hydrate. Introduce yourselves in the chat bar. You might mention where you're from and perhaps whose traditional lands you're resident on. And we'll get started in a minute or two. Good afternoon, everyone, if it's afternoon where you are. I'm Barb Chamberlain, my pronouns are she, her, and I'm the director of the Active Transportation Division with the Washington State Department of Transportation. Welcome to another session in the Washington Bike, Walk, and Roll Summit presented by Amazon. We're really excited. We have over 500 people registered for this five-day virtual event. We want to start with a land acknowledgement. The summit is virtual, so those participating are joining us from many lands. We acknowledge the land Cascade Bicycle Club sits on today as the traditional home of the Duwamish, Tulalip, Muckleshoot, and Squamish tribal nations. If you don't know whose lands you're on, you can look in the chat in a minute where you'll find a link to a map you can use to look up your place on the land. Without them, we would not have access to this environment, and we take the opportunity to thank the original caretakers of this land who are still here. We'd also like to note that we are recording this session and it will be available following the summit. The summit is hosted by Cascade Bicycle Club and Washington Bikes, two sister statewide organizations with a shared vision of bicycling for all. Cascade serves bike riders of all ages and all abilities throughout Washington State, educating new riders, advocating for safe places to ride, and holding events and rides. Washington Bikes advocates for bicyclists' rights, endorses political candidates, holds officials accountable, and works to shape policies that will make bicycling safe and accessible for all. We want to take a moment to thank our sponsors whose collective contributions have enabled us to bring together 15 panels with expert speakers and registration free for all attendees. Thanks so much to Amazon, our presenting sponsor. We also thank our supporting sponsors, the Washington State Department of Transportation, Active Transportation Division, and Eastern Washington Region. And thanks also to our general sponsors, the U.S. Department of Transportation, Federal Highways Administration, and Stacey Bain Bike Lawyers. With that, and before we transition to introducing this session, I want to take a minute to articulate our community expectations we have for all of the sessions. We're maintaining a standard of contact, conduct to ensure that all participants feel safe and respected. We believe every person has the right to be treated with dignity and respect and to be free from all forms of harassment. So we ask that you be fully present in this session. Be self-responsible and self-challenging. Listen, 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 and process suspend judgment of yourself and others, and use respectful language towards each other and the speaker. And if you have any questions or concerns during the session, you can feel free to reach out to the chat monitors through the personal message feature on the chat bar. I now really am so privileged to introduce our speaker this afternoon. Um, I genuinely mean it when I say it's a privilege to work for Washed Out with Rogers leadership. As Secretary of the Washington State Department of Transportation, he walks the talk by which I mean he walks to work in addition to reinforcing the importance of active transportation at every turn. I should say he walks to work when he's going into the office. 
He's also leading our agency into discussions about how we can be anti-racist in our work, more inclusive and more equitable in everything we do. And I get to hear that in his remarks to senior managers and read it in his messages that go out to our entire staff of thousands of people across the state. Now I want to share the formal introduction that gives you the kind of background and experience we're benefiting from. Roger Millar joined the Washington State Department of Transportation as Deputy Secretary in October of 2015, and he was appointed Secretary in August 2016. So he just had his four-year anniversary, five-year anniversary. He oversees an agency that is the steward of a complex multimodal transportation system, and he's responsible for ensuring that people and goods move safely and efficiently with all of us working with him. He's an experienced land use and transportation engineer, planner, and program manager with an international reputation for innovative approaches to conservation and development. The prominent theme that's run throughout his career has been planning and implementing transportation systems that are not ends unto themselves, but rather the means towards economic vitality, environmental stewardship, social equity, public health, and aesthetic and environmental quality. His work on the Portland streetcar and the Glenwood Springs to Aspen bus rapid transit provided communities nationwide with new modal tools. His complete streets leadership helped create a national movement for transportation systems that are safe, convenient, and pleasant for all users, regardless of how they choose to travel. His state DOT leadership, as I mentioned, is bringing innovation to ed agencies with enormous influence on transportation investment. Rogers, a fellow of the American Society of Civil Engineers and a fellow of the American Institute of Certified Planners. We sometimes use the term plan engineer for folks with that double whammy. He's a member of the American Society of Civil Engineers Board of Directors, the Intelligent Transportation Society of America Board, National Complete Streets Coalition Steering Committee, Chair of the Ashto Council on Public Transportation, this is a long list, bear with me, Chair of the Western Road Usage Charge Consortium, Co-Chair of the Mobility on Demand Alliance, and Co-Chair of the Cooperative Automated Transportation Coalition. He graduated from the University of Virginia in 1982. And with that, we'll turn it over to Roger to take it away. Great, thank you, Barb, and uh, it's great being here. Um, I've been, this is the first day of my sixth year at the Washington State DOT, and one of the smartest decisions I've made was uh, hiring Barb to run our active transportation division. It's just been wonderful, we're making great strides. Um, <clears throat> I wanted to spend a little bit of time today kind of setting the stage for a conversation with you, talk a little bit about our response to the pandemic, um, the revenue impacts to the department of the pandemic, um, how it's affected our strategic initiatives, some lessons we've learned um, that we're going to apply going forward. So when the pandemic stroke struck and we stayed home and stayed healthy, we still had to be there. We had essential maintenance that we needed to do, uh, responding to incidents, the bridges that move, emergency repairs, because we needed to support the freight industry, keeping food and emergency supplies moving, keeping essential workers moving back and forth to the jobs and getting people to and from the hospital and the like. We operate the Washington State Ferry System. They needed to be operating because there are communities that are dependent on the ferries. We needed to keep trails open on state rights of way. Um, many mistakenly think of trails as amenities. Uh, they're actually vital. Uh, to people like myself who uh, walk or, or bicycle for transportation um, because they have to or they choose to. And uh, so we, we kept them open. We supported transit agencies and inner city passenger rail. Once we you know, under, understood you know, what our role was gonna be in the pandemic, what I tell my team is the first thing we have to do is keep ourselves safe. Because if we don't keep ourselves safe, we can't keep the motoring public, the walking public, what have you, we can't keep our customers safe. And, and, and then we go about our business. So we suspended construction and maintenance activities in March of this year, uh, shutting down all the construction in Washington State. It's the first time it had ever been done. And then we worked with the governor's construction roundtable. Governor has just done a remarkable job managing us through uh, this, this crisis. Um, and in very short order, we had safety action plans together, um, equipment needed, you know, protocols and the like, so that we could reopen construction. And we've been able to do that. Um, we're back at work and in the construction world, in the maintenance world. And while we've done that, <clears throat> we've managed our safety action plans such that the incidence of positive COVID exposure, you know, people who have been exposed to the illness, are about 20% of the, 
of what the statewide average is. And the people who are, you know, are exposed and do test positive are being exposed and testing positive off of the job site. So I think it's evidence, one, that we've done a pretty good job of it, and two, evidence that wear a mask, wash your hands, social distance, it works. So safety has been important to us. The other thing we did is we all went home. Um, I am not standing in a meadow uh, in Mount Marion National Park. I am sitting on a stool in my home office, uh, which is where about 56% of our workforce has been since March. Uh, we're well over six months and we anticipate we're gonna be doing this for quite some time. The other thing that happened to us when everybody went home is they stopped driving and they stopped riding the ferry and they stopped taking transit and trains and they stopped using our toll facilities and that stopped the flow of revenue to uh, the transportation fund, which funds WashDOT and the State Patrol and the Department of Licensing and, and others. Um, over the next three years, we anticipate that uh, COVID is taken about $1.3 billion dollars out of our budget. Um, that smarts. Uh, we spend about three and a half billion a year. 1.3 billion over three years is, is quite a hit. And it's, it, it, you have to think about it in the context of all the hits that we've taken. Uh, Initiative 976 is uh, 289 million uh, this year and last and 661 million um, in 21-23, the next biennium. So 950 million in revenue we thought we were gonna have that we're not gonna have over the next three years. Uh, and then we have things that we're obligated to do. Uh, we have uh, uh, treaty obligations that the federal government made with our Native American tribes. Um, and they sued us, the federal government did, um, and we have an obligation to build $3.1 billion of fish passage improvements between now and, and 2030. We're well on the way to doing that. It's a, it's a legal obligation. Frankly, I think it's also a moral commitment. Uh, the other thing we've been emphasizing is state of good repair. Um, you know, the Chamber of Commerce wants us to build new stuff and, and that's great, but our economy doesn't run on the stuff that speculators want us to build. Our economy runs on the infrastructure that's out there today. And so first and foremost, uh, it needs to be kept in a state of good repair. And we've been having that conversation with our partners all over the state. And I think some uh, progress is being made on that. But we need uh, $7 billion that we don't have um, over the next 10 years to just keep it keep it together. So we have some strategic initiatives that have been impacted by what's going on. Um, we're very much uh, an agency that concerns itself with resilience, resilience in the face of climate change, uh, resilience in the face of the Cascadia subduction zone earthquake, which is another $1.5 billion unfunded need, getting those bridges uh, protected. Um, and a resilient economy in, uh, to be resilient in the face of the slings and arrows of uh, you know, market forces that impact us all. Um, we're very much uh, a part of decarbonizing the transportation space. Um, you know, in, here in Washington State, uh, transportation is the biggest uh, contributor to our greenhouse gas load. Uh, decarbonizing is something that we're committed to. Um, we, we talk about it and we get it done. We're right now in the process of uh, decarbonizing our ferry fleet. <clears throat> it's going to take some time, but we're building a new um, hybrid electric diesel boat. We're retrofitting three of our boats and we have plans to do more. People ask me why uh, hybrid instead of going purely electric. Uh, back to that pesky earthquake problem. If the power grid goes down, we need uh, the ferries, uh, one, to move people, and two, they actually serve as power plants um, for communities in the Puget Sound. So hybrids they'll be. Uh, we're also working with transit agencies all over the state on decarbonizing. We've got the, uh, the electric vehicle highway system uh, up and running, and we're looking to expand it as resources become available. And we're also involved in 
uh, microtransit, transportation demand management, a bunch of different ways to decarbonize the transportation space. Uh, technology and the application of technology is important to us. Uh, we're very involved in mobility on demand. Um, mobility as a service, the rest of the world calls it, but here in the good old USA, it's mobility on demand. And um, cooperative automated transportation. Um, I'm not a big fan of connected automated vehicles. Um, I am interested in cooperative automated transportation cooperative where the modes cooperate so we optimize uh, their role in the transportation space automated as opposed to autonomous because i think using technology is great but uh, being harnessed by it autonomy makes me think too much of terminator and then transportation rather than the vehicle because it's about the entire environment not just somebody's uh, gizmo governance and finance is another place that we're really interested um, the, the relationship between land use and transportation is something that DOTs are uh, traditionally warned away from. You don't go to that space, that's not your job, that's not your, it is so much our job to engage in uh, community conversations about good land use decisions and how they optimize transportation investment. And then finance. We built uh, the interstate system with 90% of the money was federal money. Uh, today, the federal government contributes about 15% to our budget. And the days of the big federal bucks are, they're gone. And uh, we need to be thinking with, with that in mind. We also need to be thinking about revenue strategies that meet our policy goals, because I wanna decarbonize the economy. At the same time, gas tax is what pays the bills. That's a problem. And then the, the whole issue of systemic racism and, and civil rights. Uh, when George Floyd was killed earlier this year, um, that wasn't an unusual event. What was unusual was that somebody caught it on camera. <clears throat> and 400 years of pent up frustration just, it, it exploded. And uh, we have to deal with that as a society and as an, an agency, we have to deal with that. Now, I'm a 61-year-old white guy, um, and I've had a lot of challenges in my career and in my life, but among those challenges has never been wondering whether I'm going to make it home from work alive or whether my kids are going to make it home from school or from the theater alive or whether they're going to be gunned down by a police officer. That's, that's not my worldview. Um, what I'm encouraging my colleagues at WashDOT to do is talk to their coworkers who do have that concern, who have lived with that as their reality. Understand it to the extent that you can and let's do something about it. So we are very much engaged in inclusion um, and diversity and equity is, is a pillar of our agency's strategic plan. It has been for quite some time. The events of this year have made it even more urgent for us. We recently led the charge at the Western Association of State Highway and Transportation Officials where we passed a resolution on systemic racism, uh, acknowledging the past, acknowledging our obligation and committing to do things better. Um, explaining to our team that while I-5 is the backbone of Washington State's economy, if your family is from the International District or South Seattle, um, I-5 destroyed your neighborhoods, destroyed your business community. And the people who are marching and closing our highways are the grandchildren and the great-grandchildren of the people uh, whose land we took uh, to build those facilities uh, because it was the path of least resistance. So we're, we're working on change and a lot more to come there. So what have we learned from the pandemic, just to close this up? You know, we've learned, I've learned, that no one is safe until everyone is safe. Social equity is going to be really, really important in post-pandemic transportation. As an industry, we often talk about first mile, last mile, you know, being important to the sense of the success of the trip and active transportation being a big part of it. But when you think about it, what we've learned from the pandemic is that our social and economic interactions 
have been stymied by the inability to travel the first and last six feet. When we can't get close to one another, we can't do business, we can't interact, we shut down. People mistakenly assume that as long as they stay in their car, they'll be safe, but you have to stay in your car. How will you get to work? You're gonna get out of your car and get into an elevator, go on a sidewalk, go into an office space, go somewhere to eat lunch. There's no way you'll be able to isolate yourself and be part of the economy and society. So we all need to be safe. And that is especially important to the service workers and other essential people that really are the key to our economy as producers and as, as consumers. And what we find is those people are the ones who live farther from work, who have fewer urban services, who are stuck with longer commutes, and who spend a higher percentage of their household incomes on housing and transportation, often more than 50% than of what a family takes in goes to the care and feeding of the fleet that they need uh, to get to and from where they make their living. So as we, as Washington State, think about affordable transportation and housing options, we've got to realize that that is not a discussion about social services. That's a discussion of economic necessity. The second thing we've learned is telecommunity. Everybody went home and plugged in and the tools that we've had <clears throat> for quite a while work. Um, we're all here and hopefully I won't go, you know, uh, that we'll stay lined up, um, got pretty good internet service where I'm at. Um, it's gonna be a big part of the new normal. We've been forced to use technology we've had for a while, we haven't embraced it. At our agency, almost 60% of our people went from a little over 10% of us telecommuting maybe one day a week to all of us telecommuting full time. And when you gauge interest in doing that going forward, most of our employees want to continue doing it uh, out of the pandemic. So the success of telecommuting is driving new thinking at WashDOT, in state agencies, in the business sector uh, about how. Um, uh, we come out of this pandemic, what worker expectations are, what office space requirements are, um, how travel patterns are going to shift. The commute is down because of telecommunity, but people who telecommute still travel. Maybe not in the morning, in the evening, but they still travel. So what does that mean to transit agencies? What does that mean to you know, people that run uh, multimodal DOTs? Um, and then you got to realize that while some people are going back to the office, many of them aren't. Um, and that's something that we need to acknowledge and our programs need to understand that a society in which information can be transmitted or received freely between all of its members without technical incompatibilities, that's telecommunity. But rural communities need access. Um, the less wealthy among us need access and it needs to be um, accessible for people of, of all abilities. So more to come in the telecommunity space, but I think we'll be spending a lot of time there. Um, we're all home in our neighborhoods. Um, another thing we've learned, many of us are seeing our neighborhoods in the daylight hours for the first time in years because we go to work in the morning and come, over, come home after dark. Um, and we're liking what we see. Um, I walk about 10 miles a day um, and uh, just to get out and about and love it. Um, my neighborhood is a mixed use neighborhood. I can, I can provide myself with food and access to healthcare and pharmacies and stuff like that by walking or riding my bicycle, but many of us can't. And even those of us who can are finding, well, you know, one, it's one thing where sidewalk and bikeway infrastructure is not there, or in my case, where it's inadequate. I spend a good part of my time when I'm walking, putting my mask back on and stepping out into the street because there's not enough room on the sidewalk. Um, we have that issue, but there's a lot we need to do to catch up on accessibility for people in wheelchairs. If they're in a the curb cut, it means you're not leaving the block. And for all of us, we need to, uh, as people are staying home, it's going to influence our desire for and need for um, safe and effective uh, active transportation investment. So we need to complete the system. You can get anywhere you want in Washington State with a car, unless you're going to Stahican. Um but there are a number of places you can't walk, you can't get there from here walking, you can't get there from here biking because the infrastructure to do that safely is just not there. 
Um, and while we saw all of our uh, driving go down, taking the ferry and, and the like during the pandemic, walking and bicycling have, have gone up 200 to 300 percent. It, you know, and finding a bike is kind of like finding toilet paper was when we first got started and all of this. The other thing that people did when they got home is they started shopping online. It really has economy. And we're seeing a lot of package delivery traffic in our communities. It's not just the Amazons and the UPSs of the world, but <clears throat> local businesses are jumping into it. Um, you know, here in Olympia and elsewhere, retail stores are providing online shopping and delivery. Uh, you could get a margarita here in Olympia. Um, that was pretty cool. So what's the public's interest in this freight going door to door? What should our investment be? How should we manage it? How do we work with providers to decarbonize what they're doing? How do we bring uh, e-cargo bikes and other electric delivery fleets into this market going forward? That's something we're thinking about. So we get ready for the questions. I just want to say we're in a unique position to rethink how we do business. Uh, working with partners and stakeholders, we're, we're developing policy recommendations uh, for the governor and the legislature. We're re-examining how we use our infrastructure so that it accommodates all people in all modes. We're ensuring our policy and program decisions are equitable and inclusive, and that we engage the public in this decision-making, something that I, I insist on is we're not gonna sit a bunch of 61 year old white men around the table and talk about women and people of color and the disabled. They need to be at the table having that conversation. We need to explore how to operate in a modern work environment. We need to look at new and flexible sources of revenue. Uh, we need to emphasize resilience for our communities um, it, in the face of pandemic and the rest is the broader issue of climate change. It's right there behind us. It was with us before, it'll be with us after the pandemic. We need to be resilient. And we need to select flexible and adaptable investment strategies that can be effective for us as we go forward into an uncertain future. So thank you for listening to me. Um, and now let's hear what you have to say. And I've been monitoring the chat, and so I'm, I'm watching for if there's multiple questions on a similar topic to kind of try to group those. And I think, Roger, if you could describe for folks uh, how it is that we are directed by the legislature to choose projects, how the projects are chosen, how we end up working on them. There's a question about whether or not we could cancel a particular project. And this morning's session with legislators, they didn't really dig into how they direct our budget. And I wonder if you could just share with people that context. Oh, well, sure, sure, I'd be happy to. Um, you know, there have been three transportation revenue packages in the 21st century in Washington State. Um, the, the Nickel package, the Transportation Partnerships Act, and Connecting Washington. Um, Connecting Washington was the first of the three that had any money in it for preservation. Um, and that was a good thing. It moved us from spending uh, 500 million a year to 550 million a year on preservation statewide. We need to spend 1.2 billion. But what most of what was in nickel and TPA and the like was by you, you paid five and nine and 11.2, whatever cents more a gallon for the gasoline you bought. But that money was directed to a list of projects that was put together by the legislature. And so when our budget is debated and passed by the legislature and signed by the governor, we get an appropriation and we get a very specific list of projects to spend that money on. So people ask me, yeah, Malar, you're, you're talking the talk. Why aren't you walking the walk? You're building this, you're building that. Those are our projects that we have been legislatively directed to do and we cannot spend the money any other way. Um, if you as a uh, person who lives in Washington state object to that, um, the conversation needs to be uh, with your legislators. What we're trying to do as a, as a department, as subject matter experts, is um, give recommendations on uh, what are we doing about state of good repair, first of all, what are we doing about safety for all modes, what are we doing about system management and demand management, and, and then when we need to add capacity, let's do it the right way. Uh, programmatic budgeting would be a great thing. Um, we do not have that. So uh, that's how it is today. I, I can say 
um, that I have been really, really pleased with the conversations that I've had with the chairs and the ranking members of the two committees and members of those two transportation committees that have really engaged in this interim. Uh, they see this as an opportunity for change, um, as I see it uh, as an opportunity for change. And we're having some really substantive discussions that, that hopefully play out as we move forward. But you got to remember that every project on that list that you hate, um, somebody loves. And uh, they, you know, what's the old saying, even, even ugly babies have proud parents. Um, you know, those projects, uh, you might not like it, I might not like it, but there's somebody who really likes it a lot and uh, they got a commitment to getting it built. So uh, change is, is, is hard and that's, that's the way uh, our world works. Sticking with the legislative side for a minute, and then there's a question about how we work with local partners that I'll, I'll come back to. There's a question specifically about what our department's position would be if there were a carbon tax proposed for transportation funding, but maybe just more broadly sort of our agency process when proposals come up and how we handle those. You know, we're not asked about funding. Um, we're asked about how it would be implemented. Um, and, you know, the difficulties we, you know, I, I sit on, I chair the Western uh, States Road Juicer Charge Consortium. I'm involved with, with other groups. Um, the legislature determines what revenue sources are appropriate for Washington State. The governor has a big part of that, too. Uh, they ask us, um, they've talked to the Transportation Commission, which is not a part of the Washington State DOT, about road user charges. Um, <clears throat> they've asked us about, you know, if we charged this kind of fee based on what you know, how much would it generate? We get, we get those kinds of, of conversations. Um, the advice I've been giving them is let's not replicate what we've done with the gas tax. We, we want to reduce driving. It's, it's in our policy. It's not, you know, I, I personally believe in it. But if you look at what the RCW directs the DOT to do, it's to reduce VMT per capita and look for alternative ways of getting around. But we fund all of that with gas tax. So, and there, there's an obvious disconnect there. So as we go forward, you know, my advice has been, as you look at funding, let's develop funding sources that make it easier to do the right thing uh, than we, where we're at today. And I think that uh, addressed a couple of the questions about what we would, like we don't propose revenue generation ideas, we respond to those ideas. There's a question about how we interact with our local partners when we're working between the curbs and they're working outside the curbs. And I know you've talked a lot about that. Maybe expand on how we coordinate with those other jurisdictions. Yeah, and, and again, that, that's in state law. Um, that for jurisdictions over a certain size, and those numbers move a lot, there are different responsibilities and different authorities in the public right of way. I think local governments wanted control over things like speeds and uses of the right of way um, when the state highway happens to be Main Street. So um, out in unincorporated land and in small communities, the DOT, it's, it's ours. Um, in those larger communities, um, we are responsible for and have control over what's between the curbs and the stuff behind the curbs is the responsibility of, of local government. An example of that was uh, we had a paving project on uh, State Route 99 in the north part of Seattle that uh, we saw coming for years. It was on our asset management list and we were budgeting it and programming it and programming it. And we reached out, um, my predecessor and I reached out for several years to the city of Seattle saying, we're coming in and doing this big project. As a part of that, we have a, an ADA plan. Uh, it's a legal obligation on the DOT. As a part of that, we put in curb ramps, <clears throat> but we don't do sidewalk because that state law, that's not our responsibility. We don't have the authority and the revenue that's appropriated for us is for work between the curb lines. But we would love to work together with you to make that happen. Sometimes that happens. Sometimes it doesn't. In the case of the, the North Seattle project, it didn't happen. The resources that the city had available to it, it had other priorities for, and they weren't going to do that work. So we did what we had to do. 
um, State Route 99 was repaved, but I think we all lost an opportunity. The important thing to me is that we as agencies, whether it's Washington State DOT or a city agency or a county agency or a port or a transit agency, we need to spend less time thinking about who owns it and more time thinking about what the needs are, regardless of who owns it and what the needs are, regardless of how people get around. I'm really interested in finding ways that we can spend our money off system if it solves a problem. So quite often, the protected bicycle facility shouldn't be on the state highway. The safest and most convenient and most direct route is over there. But we can't spend our money over there. I'd, I'd like to be able to. Uh, we had an example, it's not a good bicycle example or walking example, but we had an example in Spokane where the city annexed land uh, to develop, to create a housing opportunity. And they committed when we, we allowed them to put their water and sewer lines in our right of way, they committed to building a road to access that land so that people wouldn't have to use the highway to commute. They didn't build the road. The development's there. Everybody comes down the hill in the morning to go into Spokane and they turn left across a five lane, 65 mile an hour facility. And people have died making that turn. Now they chose not to make that investment because a $40 million investment in an arterial street would have made the development cost prohibitive. Now with my land use planner hat on, that makes the development cost prohibitive. It's a dumb thing to do unless you subsidize it in this case by not making the investment. So 40 million bucks to fix the highway problem that has been created is a half a billion dollars that we don't have. So would I rather spend 40 million solving a problem or even better spend absolutely nothing helping the city redevelop housing opportunities within the current boundaries of the city rather than sprawling out on, on the green space? Absolutely. We, we need to be thinking new ways. I've got a couple questions on different aspects of how we work with rail right of way. One, one is how might we might approach rail banking where we are, and I think particularly the PCC line where the state actually owns that line, but maybe more broadly around how we interact on rail trails and trails. We're an active partner in a lot of that. You know, we are responsible for 300 miles of short line railroad, you know, the PCC line. Um, and we uh, work with the private sector to operate grain trains on a lot of that. And a lot of it is not currently being used. And again, it gets back to we're an active partner. We want to see stuff done. But as anybody who's gotten into rails to trails and rail, rail banking and the rest of that, it's a very interesting dance between the advocates for trails, the advocates for continued rail, um, the property owners who would rather that land just revert back to them and all y'all go away. You know, and so we, we engage in that conversation. <clears throat> we play an active role in it. One of the things that Barb and I are doing is, again, the importance of this. These are essential services, they're not amenities. That, that trail may be the way somebody gets to the doctor or gets to the store or gets to school or gets to work. And the extent to which people understand that, um, that we're gonna be more successful. There's a great question, and this is helping in particular folks who have to interact and advocate from the local to the state level about how it works when a pro what project go into a city's plan, then it ends up in an MPO tip, how it ends up in the stip. Would you mind doing sort of a, a 101 on projects getting onto lists locally up to the state level? That's a- to that's Go back to your MPO days. That's a great question. I used to run the MPO in Missoula, Montana. And, you know, a, a lot of what's in the MPOs is uh, one of the reasons they exist is to uh, distribute the federal money that is sub-allocated through the state to regional governance. And you know, the big MPOs like the Puget Sound Regional Council, the MPO in Spokane, the one down in, in Vancouver are, are allocating substantial amounts of money um, that comes from the federal government through the DOT and it's available to local governments in their, in their boundaries. And 
they run, they do a long range transportation plan. They update that on a regular basis, typically every five years or so. Um, and then they do um, a, a STIP or a TIP transportation improvement plan that's more about how that money's gonna be programmed over a shorter period of time than the, than the 20 years. Um, and then they do a unified work program, which is kind of an annual thing. Um, and different MPOs have different procedures for competing that money, but it's, it's generally a competition. Um, so that is one source of funds that local governments look to. Local governments also look to their local funding sources, their sales tax, their property tax and the like. They look to their legislators to get a chunk of money, you know, it provisoed into our budget so that stuff happens. They used to look to the federal uh, delegation for earmarks. That doesn't happen anymore. Um, they're competing on a regular basis for things like uh, build grants or, you know, the old Tiger program or the INPRA program, um, kind of like buying a lottery ticket. But, you know, any project sponsor is going to be building that financial pie that makes their project successful or makes a project viable. They're, they're building it one slice at a time and hoping it all comes together. Uh, that takes talent um, and a depth of resource that many smaller communities don't have. So we as an agency, one of the, our big purposes is to provide technical assistance to communities around the state on active transportation, on public transportation, on local, local highways, how to, how to get that done. Um, we work in partnership with TIB and CRAB and FIMSIB and the whole alphabet soup of, of agencies, but there's a lot of stuff out there. And uh, you know, keeping uh, aware of just the changes and how that's done uh, is, is quite interesting. And my dog just got home, uh, two-year-old chocolate lab. So if he jumped on me, I apologize in advance. Oh, nice. I may have a kitten make an appearance at some point, COVID kitten. Um, a little bit more perhaps for folks, the fact that we have a local programs division and administer local gr grants is not something that everybody's familiar with. So maybe a touch on that and how the HSIP money <laughs> ends up on local streets. Well, you know, again, um, the, the state legislature, the governor recommends, the state legislature decides how the federal money uh, that flows through our local programs and, and, and how the state money that flows through our local programs, uh, how it is allocated. Uh, we run um, regular competitions for money. Um, uh, the national highway system money that came to the state with the FAST Act, a commitment I made um, that the governor and the legislature followed through on was all of the new NHS money that came to the state of Washington went to our local programs division to be invested in preservation on the elements of the national highway system that local government cities and counties owned. And we have a competition, you know, you, you talk to your local programs division, uh, people in our region offices or in our headquarters and uh, they get you set up. Most communities are, are well aware of how that works, um, but it's, it's for a lot of people in the advocacy world in particular, uh, it's a fairly steep learning curve. I would encourage you to uh, talk to your local people, um, talk to your MPO and RTPO people, um, contact your uh, local programs people in uh, our region offices around the state, and talk to people like Barb. another question about our work inside the curbs and what that might imply for bike infrastructure and do we mean it has to be adjacent to or mixed with car traffic um i don't read it that way but i want to check that i i'm reading it correctly but what we could do inside the curbs we could stripe a bike lane we could put in a protected bike lane whatever kind of bike infrastructure was appropriate inside the curbs and yeah. still be yeah yeah okay. yeah we, we I mean, paint you know Paint is easy, and that's one of the things that when, when I was running the Complete Streets Movement, one of the things we talked to communities about is when you're doing your, your routine pavement overlay jobs, think twice about where the paint goes back. You're gonna pay for it one way or the other. You know, think twice about that. We're, we're thinking, I think, more creatively about speed and paint. You know, the, one of the reasons the lanes are so wide is some, you know, a traffic engineer a couple of generations or, go, or, or more ago said, well, once you get to a certain speed, the lane's got to be this wide. Well, slow it down, narrow it up. Maybe there's some room for uh, bicycle facilities and uh, it's just paint. 
in a low speed environment. In a higher speed environment, when you're looking to protect the lanes, and uh, as someone who did a, a little bike learning over in, in Copenhagen, um, those protected facilities are where we need to go. Um, we run into, as an agency, um, the current or past interpretations of the limits of the 18th Amendment that um, are, are being discussed you know, in, in today's world. Uh, but you know, we, we are somewhat constrained by the color of the money, if you will, about how we can spend what we've got. And that was one of the questions about being able to use transportation funds for act, gas tax revenues for active transportation, if you want to expand on that at all. Uh, federal gas tax, sure. Um, you know, gas, uh, federal tax, it's, it's eligible for, you know, depending on, the, again, the program that you're in. Uh, but we can spend that money on moving uh, people who walk and people who bicycle. State gas tax revenue is, is dedicated for highway purposes. And while driving a car or driving a truck on the highway is a highway purpose, apparently walking isn't um, in some applications of, of that, that rule, of that amendment. Um, those rules were originally, the amendments when they were originally uh, peddled around the country, it was all about keeping transportation dollars in the transportation space, not using it to supplement the general fund. Um, but it has somewhat limited us because when those decisions were being made, everybody was thinking highways. They weren't thinking multimodal like we have today. Um, there are a lot of people that were concerned, you know, in, in the highway space, the trucking community, um, who legitimately understands there's not enough money to, to build and operate and maintain the system that they would like to see to move freight in Washington State, they zealously protect that money for those purposes. And I, I understand that. Um, we need to understand and we need to help them understand. It's it interesting. I was talking to the Washington Trucking Association early in the pandemic. And because everybody was staying home, they were just, they were getting to work. They were getting stuff to market in no time at all because they didn't see the congestion that used to be in their way. And I said, you know, this telecommunity, People walking, people riding bicycles, that's fewer people in cars in front of you. So by making investments in walking and in biking and in telecommunity, <clears throat> taking public transportation, we're creating capacity in the highway system in, in ways that are a lot less expensive and impactful than adding lanes to the facilities. You think about what the power companies did when, when uh, nuclear went you know, kablooey and, and the nuclear power is gone. Coal is, 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 is dirty and, and problematic. Oil is dirty and problematic. Where do we get energy? You know, renew, lots of renewable energy here in the Northwest, but um, the compact uh, fluorescent light bulbs and low flow shower heads that, that the energy companies give out, um, they're good people, but they don't give them to you and I because they're good people. They give them to you and I because it's good business. It frees up capacity in their system that they can sell at unregulated rates to industry. It makes them money. Um, if we can encourage people to walk, to ride bicycles, to telecommute, to take transit, we can make those same kinds of investments as a way to create capacity in our system for the folks who have to be there or want to be there. It's all about creating choices for folks. That's the, the thinking and the conversation we need to have. It's not um, a war on cars. I mean, that's, that's ridiculous. It's what can we do to provide enough space for all of us to safely and conveniently and economically get where we need to go by whatever mode we choose or need to use to get there. I'm watching time. We've got about 10 minutes left and we've got some great rich questions. So I'm going to try to put them into topics and you can tackle them however you want. One was about the fact that funding may be siloed, but adverse outcomes are not siloed. So transportation effects show up in health budgets. So is there any pro pr prospect that we might get health funding that's investing in prevention? So that's one piece. Then there's a great question about looking at the neighborhood scale. And for me, these are very related that we look at 
buy in on the idea that transportation is part of making neighborhoods function and um, and thrive for people, and you've, you've mentioned that. And then there's a third question about safety, since state law does provide for investing in bicycle and pedestrian infrastructure to improve safety for motorists, because, you know, we're scary when we're out there on our bikes. Um, but if we're investing in safety and working on health and working on neighborhoods, where does that take us as an agency? Well, and I yeah, think yeah. I did justice to all those. That was a lot of questions. I think that's, that's great. And it, it, it all comes down to what we measure and the metrics we use to manage you know when we do our work in the transportation space from really the advent of the automobile on it was all about <clears throat> vehicle miles and speeds and it was all about metrics around the car what we're beginning to talk about is health metrics and you know we we talk an awful lot about crashes um, but what we measure and how we talk about it as a society, I am constantly bombarded by reports from interest group after interest group after consulting firm after consulting firm about how bad the traffic is and the cost of congestion to Washington's economy. You know, the cost of congestion to Washington's economy is three and a half billion dollars a year. And we all lose hours and hours and hours, you know, stuck in traffic. We need to add capacity to make something happen. And I thought that was important to know. But if you think about the 540 people who die every year on Washington highways and the thousands of people who are maimed every year on Washington highways, it's five times the economic impact of congestion. We never talk about it. What we've started doing as an agency is calculating it and putting it out there. Now it's up to you as advocates to use that information. I did some work when I was with Smart Growth America working with the Minnesota DOT. We looked at what were the health benefits of uh, putting a complete street through a community because they were trying to, to measure the cost and the benefit of their investments. And they never measured it based on, okay, if after the improvement is made, more people are walking and biking, what does that save society in terms of health costs because you have a healthier um, population. Uh, we're beginning to put the information together. We're beginning to put the tools together to, to do that kind of analysis. Um, people say, well, why don't you drop everything you're doing and put all those tools together right now? It's, it's kind of like um, changing the tire on a moving bicycle. Uh, it, you know, it, it, it is difficult to do. We cannot shut the world down while we retool but we're, we're working on on that retooling and when we talk about the, the the benefit of investment not the cost of spending but the benefit of investment uh, we need to be thinking about the benefit of investment in things other than or in, including but not limited to how fast you go and how many you can put through there we need to think about Okay, is there a health benefit and what is it? Is there a, um, a safety benefit and what is it? Is there an equity benefit and what is it? So that, you know, again, advocates and decision makers can say, it makes more sense to invest the money over here than over there for these reasons. You know, if, you, if you don't have the words, you can't think the thoughts. And if you don't have the, the data, you can't do the persuading that making this investment is a huge investment with a huge return base, base versus making this other investment, which may move more cars, but when you add it all up, is of less value to society as a whole. We've got one question I think I missed as I was scrolling through. Um, when we talk about active transportation in, in the work of our division, we talk about accessible active transportation and maybe reflect on our obligations. We've got an ADA transition plan. What is it that other agencies also need to be doing to provide accessible active transportation? Well, we, we need to be complying with the law. Um, and uh, the law has been in place for quite a while, and we've done some of what we need to do 
to get in compliance. Um, I am not a down in the weeds expert on this, but if, if you're interested, get in touch with us and uh, my friend Larry Watkinson will, will help you understand all the nuances of it. Um, but it, it is at the end of the day about people being able to safely get where they need to go, um, regardless of their ability um, and regardless of how they choose to go there. Um, we're understanding it better than we've understood it in the past and we're making investments. We, we've done a lot of work on uh, partnering with our, our local partners, uh, stuff like our Safe, Healthy and Active Streets Initiative. Um, I don't think would have been uh, thought of uh, five years ago, 10 years ago. And we're, we're having those conversations now. We're getting away from that 85th percentile silliness and talking about managing speed in different ways. There's a lot of conversations going on. You have to understand that we, we, we work in a competitive place with a lot of advocates for a lot of positions. And uh, Barb and I, we work in a fishbowl. Everything we do is subject to review and criticism by, by any number of people. Um, I regularly get tweets from people which are, uh, you know, are about me uh, from people uh, about, uh, you know, talking about um, you know, the safe, healthy streets thing was, was incredible. It was, how dare you, how dare you close the lane of traffic down so that businesses could stay open? <laughs> it was what it basically came down to. Um, and you have to understand that doing what we do um, I do run a big agency, but I run a big agency whose mission and budget are crafted by the people that you and I elect and, and send to Olympia to work on this stuff. I think all things considered, they do a pretty darn good job, but they're making decisions based on information that's available to them and, and what they're hearing from uh, their constituents, the people that sent them. Um, and so I encourage you, uh, as I encourage them, learn more, ask questions. Uh, no idea I had ever got better because everybody agreed with it. Point out the flaws. We'll fix it. We'll make it better. That's, that's what we do. We're coming up on time, and I think we've covered all the questions that I've seen dropped into the chat box. So this is your last chance to quickly type if you weren't already doing so. I know um, we want to thank Roger for his time and remind folks that there will be a networking session at 530 this evening. You can come in and connect with people, talk informally. This is the hallway conversation part of the summit um, happening online. And then we'll pick up again in the morning at 830 Exciting for me is we're going to be talking about our network analysis that we've done of state right of way. So it's part of the backbone of the active transportation plan. So watch for that. Um, watch for there, there will be a link dropped in here to ask you your feedback on this session as well. And Roger, I just ask you if you have any parting thoughts or recommendations for all the folks here. You know, I. I'm glad you're here. Um, you obviously have uh, an interest in the subject matter and you're gaining uh, an understanding of the subject matter. I you know, am constantly amazed uh, by the, 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 the intelligence and the resilience of, of the people of Washington State. Um, given good information, we make good decisions as, as a community, as a state. We're working on good information. Uh, we're working on getting that information out, but it, it takes uh, people like you who care uh, to learn um, uh, and to poke and prod and, uh, and advocate for, for what you do. Um, as I said just a couple minutes ago, nothing ever got better because everybody agreed with it. So don't, you know, insist on something better. That's what I do. Um, and, and recognize too that uh, these things, uh, while they're urgent, um, they take time. So when you're out there uh, making your point, a, a little patience is, is always appreciated because while we're changing the world, we're also patching the potholes and fixing the guardrails and fighting fires and dealing with floods and plowing snow and all the other stuff that uh, ain't sexy, but it's necessary to keep, keep our economy going. I, I'm hopeful that uh, the work we do going forward is, um, is good for our economy, that it's better for our environment, 
um, and that it advances our society uh, to the benefit of, of all of us. So thanks for what you do. Thanks for listening and enjoy the rest of your conference. Thanks all and we'll see you in the networking space and tomorrow morning. Thanks so much, Roger. Thank you.